very happy to be here. Um, well, uh, you already said the strange title of my presentation. The, of course, the, 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 the play is on the word ages and agency, which are in some way connected because the, the main uh, core, uh, the, the core business of my presentation uh, will be uh, the facial age, which is a, a quite interesting thing, I think. And uh, already being mentioned uh, en passant, uh, during the presentations that uh, uh, preceded mine. Uh, so here I provide uh, um, a brief summary of uh, uh, the things I would like to explore with you. First of all, uh, I will provide a, a really short uh, definition of agency, um, basically useful for my uh, theorization, because of course we know that uh, agency is a complex issue and uh, I, I do not have the presumption here to recap all the uh, perspectives about this uh, um, philosophical issue. Then uh, I will go uh, into the, the signs of aging. Uh, uh, you see that the word sign is emphasized because it's, a, it's a basically the first semiotic word we all uh, learned when we started our uh, semiotic uh, um, studies. And the idea of the phase as a presuppositional machine, the idea of lying about age through faces. So let's say an analogical Pinocchio before, and then a digital Pinocchio, uh, when these uh, uh, lies are uh, uh, conceived and uh, uh, carried out uh, through digital, uh, um, meanings uh, through digital uh, media. Uh, and uh, the second part is about the rhetoric about uh, the facial ages, ba basically the uh, opposition between uh, uh, infanti infantile, juvenile face and adult or old face uh, with uh, a focus on the uh, main technicals of the aging and hyper aging in, in cinema and uh, media. So I immediately start uh, um, by utilizing this source, uh, which is uh, an old issue of, of Lexia, obviously edited by Massimo Leone. Uh, and I think this uh, uh, could be the good way to understand agency by a semiotic perspective, because uh, um, in this uh, volume, uh, which is kind of uh, more than uh, 400 pages, uh, we find uh, different perspectives. And here in, in this uh, uh, definition, I try to collect them all. So the idea is that agency uh, concerns a subject of doing, um, that agency presupposes a significity uh, that causes things a significant events. Here Ugo Volli talks about uh, metaphysical attribution, that agency concerns an ability to make something do something. And it's very important to understand that agency is not necessarily anchored to a principle of intentionality. So uh, there is agency before the ideology, the ideology of agency, um, the, a, a specific semiotic, moral or legal regime. So there is agency basically when, where there is connectivity, perlocution, effectiveness, what does it mean? It means that agency is not a semiotic category, but it, it's a, a meta-semiotic category. It regards every semiotic act, every uh, sign and every text. And we enlight agency during our analysis if we are interested in searching for agency. Um, this is very important because the fact is that usual, usually we think of uh, agents connected the world to uh, subjects but we must think that uh, also signs and images uh, and text uh, and so on, uh, and so images, uh, scenes, uh, verbal text can be agents, can have their own agency. For example, in this source, uh, the semiotics of uh, Che Guevara by uh, Maria Carolina Cambre, there are uh, uh, reflections about uh, the uh, image, the very famous icon of Che Guevara and uh, its capability of, an, I think we, we can agree uh, that image is a phase, a stylized phase. It's capability of uh, creating certain effects of making people uh, 
do something. So here we have a quotation, uh, Cambre uh, uses uh, as a, a main source uh, uh, gel and says Chev image is a congealed residue of performance and agency in object form through which access to other persons can be attained and via which their agency can be communicated. And she continues, we can conceive of just agency for an artwork or image as a modality through which something affects something else and is absolutely relational and context dependent. So given the necessary context, whatever type of action a person may perform vis-a-vis -vis another person may be performed also by a work of art in the realms of imagination, if not in reality. We recognize agency by its effects. An artifact, and here um, Cambre uh, elaborates a typology of agencies. So uh, she says basically there are two kinds of agency, a primary agency usually uh, implied by uh, human or living subjects, and a secondary agency implied by objects and artifacts. There is the example of a doll, and it's interesting because uh, we already talked about dolls uh, uh, this morning. For example, when a child feeds a doll because it is hungry, sorry for the typo, the doll is a secondary agent to the degree that it is able to channel or become a conduit for the primary agent's action. Another important source, uh, which is a, a semiotic source, I think, uh, is uh, Horst Bredekamp. Or, Horst Bredekamp uh, spends uh, uh, lots of uh, energies and efforts in order to build uh, uh, a, the a theory of the iconic act. Uh, this is the, the, the book, uh, Theorie uh, des Bildacts. Uh, and here, again, uh, it is developed with, uh, this theory is developed by starting from a, a presumption the idea that images can decide the fate of the beholder, um, that images uh, have uh, their own alien corporeality, uh, that images intervene. Um, Bredekamp uh, uh, recalls uh, some Renaissance theories and uh, speaking about uh, imagines agentes, uh, and that images uh, uh, can. Uh, impose a kind of impression of vitality and presence. These uh, sentences are quite, uh, uh, let's say blurry, let's say fuzzy, uh, but uh, uh, declined in a semiotic perspective. When we say that uh, an image has a vitality and a presence, we are saying that uh, an, image, uh, an image gives uh, itself to our interpretation. So basically we are talking about interpretative cooperation. And this is the base of the theory of the iconic act. And we have lots of other sources. The, so today, my, I, I, I talk about faces as, first of all, visual uh, devices. So something you see, and something you see through the signs that compose it. We know that when we recognize a face, we do not count every sign, but we uh, we, we recognize it through a holistically gestaltic uh, um, apparatus, but of course, uh, this apparatus is made by science. And the face, in the moment in which it gives to interpretation, is already an agent. We activate agency detection devices, and for example, we uh, decide, as uh, Marco Viola uh, proved, uh, if that face is uh, uh, trustworthy, or dangerous and so on and so forth. So the subject wearing the face is, is aware of his or a agency, which he or she can partially reconstruct. And this is the semiotic issue. That agency is a fluid, is a malleable agency because we can intervene uh, in our faces and we can lie through our faces. Um, for example, we can lie about our age. Um, the fact is that, uh, as I write, uh, it's more difficult to light when uh, the signs are more marked. If we are very, very old, it's more difficult to, uh, to seem very, very young. Uh, what are the signs of age on our faces? For example, our color, and we can intervene in, uh, to, in order to change our hair color 
uh, with, uh, uh, I don't know, many techniques, eye colors, wrinkles, the size of the ears. We know that ears uh, uh, grow uh, uh, lifetime. Uh, the presence of spots, uh, the melasma, the so-called lentigo senili, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, and every of these signs, uh, uh, it's uh, as an agency because uh, it uh, um, involves our age. And when we detect the age of a person through uh, her or his face, we change sometimes uh, in a very significantly uh, way our interaction with her or his uh, uh, face and person. And also sometimes there are moral or uh, legal changes. For example, uh, um, if we have a, I don't know, a sexual intercourse with a person <laughs> who seems uh, uh, 20, years old, 20 years old, and then we discover uh, he or she are uh, 16 years old, uh, it is a problem. So, uh, and we base the, our age detection, for example, by looking at her or his face. Let me say that uh, this is not a, uh, a, a merely theoretical issue because the agency of images uh, uh, and the capability of lying about our uh, e age uh, to faces uh, uh, is connected with lots of uh, social issues, uh, issues uh, social stigmas, uh, all the Peter Pan syndrome, uh, syndrome is uh, the, the so-called poor eternus aesthetics, uh, uh, maybe also a, a feeling of thanatophobia. So the idea of uh, uh, stay younger, uh, stay young in order to uh, don't uh, look at death, uh, but also we can want, we, 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 we want to achieve uh, uh, specific purposes, catfishing, uh, gain certain fame, certain web reputation and analogic reputation. We want to generate certain aesthetic effects. Here we have the case of uh, Chao Biluo, Chao Biluo is a, was, but maybe is a very famous Chinese influencer uh, who in 2019 um, was protagonist of a scandal because she used to appear like the image in the right part, uh, but this appearance was made through a not very complex uh, ensemble of digital filters. Uh, and while she was a 50 years, uh, sorry, 58 year old uh, woman. So she um, wanted to appear young. She was very famous, but then during a live streaming, there was a glitch. And during the glitch, her audience uh, saw her real face. And it, it, it was a scandal because uh, she, um, lost lots of funds, lots of uh, money and lots of things uh, because of this revelation of the lie of her face. Here we have uh, um, a little uh, um, contribution about this. When her beauty cam filter, a seemingly young beauty vlogger accidentally exposed herself when her beauty cam filter glitched during a live vlog, revealing her true 58 year old identity. What's up, guys, and happy Monday. It's Emil and it's Junior back here on Clever News. And in what may be the most bizarre topic I've ever reported on, a beauty vlogger just managed to catfish the crap out of her 100,000 plus social media followers at one time by way of technological glitch. So the Chinese vlogger who is worshipped by her many followers as a young, cute goddess was recently exposed as an actual 58-year-old woman who'd been using a beauty filter during a live stream. Like, what? The vlogger was going about her live stream, giving a routine broadcast on the streaming platform Do You when the entire platform glitched, revealing her actual identity. The filter was designed to alter appearances, making you look much younger and let's be real, hashtag flawless. So of course, there were lots of interventions on, on, on her face, but the first thing was to look younger. Uh, there are, of course, conspiracy theories about this glitch. Someone says that uh, it was uh, uh, made by herself in order in order to gain more uh, uh, visibility through the scandal. But uh, we don't want to be uh, as a um, crazy semiotician um, and to believe to this conspiracy theories theory. We are interested in the fact that uh, uh, this uh, uh, lie. Uh, was a semiotic operation on her face made through digital 
filters and it uh, had uh, very uh, strong effects before and after the discovery of the lie. Um, why? Because there are also re rhetorics about uh, uh, faces and facial ages, and this rhetoric can be uh, betrayed. So, for example, and I apologize, this is very schematic because uh, I have no time to develop all the spectrum of the possibilities. But if we think of childish faces, we know that immediately we associate to them certain uh, behavioral and moral components, uh, naivety, uh, harmlessness, uh, innocence, and so on. While uh, uh, if we look at adult faces, uh, we immediately associate, associate uh, completeness of the self, uh, full agency, responsibility. But these <laughs> associations are again fluid. We can change them, and through changing them, we can obtain several effects. The rhetoric about uh, behind this uh, um, this uh, semiotic operation is based on the idea of uh, veridiction. So the fact that uh, to seem is equal to be. But if we know Grama, uh, Gramesian square of definition, we know that uh, the side uh, uh, of lie is implied in this uh, um, when we change this uh, uh, equation. Um, so what does it what, what does it happen when, for example, we we put the responsibility which is also associated to the uh, adult face, uh, and we we move it uh, into the childish face, something like this. We are inventing a narrative <laughs> genre which is the child-based horror. The question is uh, why horror movies are full of children. Uh, beautiful children with very sweet faces uh, who uh, have the evil inside, who are possessed, who are very bad creatures. Why these movies are so disturbing for certain audiences? Because uh, there is a perceptual discrasia between the uh, expectations associated with the young face and the behavioral uh, um, and, and the behaviors of these uh, uh, children. Here, there is a, a, a quite famous example. Well, the, the novel, uh, the original novel, it's not quite, uh, um, it's a science fiction novel called uh, The Midwich Cuckoos uh, by John Wyndham. It's not very um, good. It's a quite, um, I don't know, uh, airport paperback or something like that. But then there are two filmic versions uh, very famous. The first one is by Wolf Rilla in the 60s, Village of the Damned, and the second one is uh, uh, by John Carpenter in 1995. And here I show you the trailer, but you can see already in the thumbnail this evil creature which has this uh, strange uh, sweet face but with something uncanny, also um, implied by the uh, white hair. So the juxtaposition, the superimposition of two different uh, age features in the same face. Let's see the trailer. At precisely 10 a.m. in a quiet seaside village, something happened, something unexplainable, something unbelievable. There's a lot of pregnancies, much more than would normally be expected. All the pregnancies seem to date from the day of the blackout. Oh, no. Now, this town is about to discover that looks can kill. There have been a few casualties. I should say accidents that might be related to contact with the children. My daughter was involved. Who are they? <laughs> so the question is, who are they? We cannot recognize them uh, anymore. And uh, this is all connected with the, the, the mythology of the, um, I think in English is the broad, the la covata, this idea of uh, the broad. Um, we have, as I said, an entire filmography based on this uh, horror, uh, on, on these uh, ch uh, children, uh, evil children, uh, very famous movies. For example, why in The Ex Exorcist, uh, the, which uh, Michel Desserteaux uh, studied a lot, uh, um, why um, 
the possessed protagonist is a little girl. The same is in uh, The Ring, uh, all the J horror uh, movies, uh, in The Shining, uh, uh, the twins, but also the, the little protagonist, uh, um, Danny Torrance, and so on. The other side is, the, uh, for example, the side of the Lolitas. So all the uh, issues related to more or less paraphiliac <laughs> uh, desires, uh, Lolita by Nabokov and then by Kubrick, but also Sinfonia Pastorale by Gide, which is the story of a, of a love between an old man and a young uh, woman, uh, and also all the issues related to the so-called barely legal uh, teen porn. Uh, if you go into the main uh, tube uh, porn sites, uh, uh, there is always the, cate the category uh, related to teens, and teens are not real teens, but are people with these faces and these bodies, which in some way recall the idea of uh, teenagers. For example, uh, the, the, the male one is uh, uh, Jordi El Nino Polla. Uh, this is uh, his name. So it's a matter, as I said, of unfilled expectations, which generates this disturbing effect, uh, uh, as I said, because of the disclosure between behavior and appearance and resemblance. Um, the, it, it, it's the same with the eroticism related to this figure. Also, if you want to do a very uh, basic uh, paratextual analysis, let's see the, 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 the books related to Asian horror, and we see that there is always or often the presence of uh, the uh, close up of. Uh, uh, these uh, children. And then we have saw so, a subsequent normalization. Once cultures have realized the icastic potential of this dyscrasia, they assimilate this effect and model it. And in fact, child based horror is now a fully codified trend, especially in certain cultures. Uh, there are also some interesting, interesting urban legends, for example, the one about indigo children, Bambini Indaco. I have no time to discuss it here. Um, of course, there are uh, uh, intermediate zones, so zones of adult people uh, who, with the aid of uh, digital technologies, uh, de-age themselves. Uh, a very famous case is the, uh, is the one represented by this meme, uh, the curious case of uh, Benjamin Button. Uh, remember Benjamin Button? This is him now, feel old yet. Um, I, I, I cut this part, but another very important case, the one by uh, represented by the, the Irishman by Martin Scorsese, where Robert De Niro uh, plays uh, the same role, but uh, dislocated in different ages uh, during the lifetime of the of the character uh, he acts. Uh, so here uh, we are talking no more about uh, simple makeup, but we are talking about technologies based on deep learning and based on big uh, data sets of images taken from the career, the filmic career of Robert De Niro. Here you see uh, mm, a resume about this thing. It was like the army. You followed orders. You did the right thing. You got rewarded. The film takes place from 1949 to 2000. And it goes back and forth in time. Problem is, by the time I was ready to make the film, Bob De Niro and Al Pacino and Pesci could no longer play these characters younger in makeup. I was shooting Silence in Taiwan, and Pablo, violin, came up to me and said, I think I could make them look younger. And I said, I don't know. I can't have the actors talking to each other with golf balls on their faces. It maybe gets in the way with the actors and the kind of film this is, they need to play off each other. Would you like to be a part of this history? So I just kind of took a breath and I said, you yeah, know, we'll develop the technology. One thing that was very important was that Marty would not feel restricted in any way. We understood what the challenges would be, meaning no markers or, or facial headcams or things like that. The Nero says to me, I just want to work on set with the real lighting, with the other actors. We're going to ad lib a lot. We're going to uh, play a lot. And I just don't want any interference. So the challenge was to dismiss, uh, uh, to dismiss uh, previous technologies based, for example, on mapping uh, uh, through spots, uh, the uh, the the muscles of the of the actors, uh, and to consent the actors uh, to act uh, in uh, in their uh, environment without touching them, 
uh, during the shooting and also by intervening in it before the shooting with the performances. So we immediately divided into two groups, one that was developing the camera system and the other one that kept working on the software. We developed this new rig, which is the camera surrounded by two what we call witness cameras, which are infrared cameras. And so if you were to take a look at those infrared images, what you would see is that there is no shadows. With the complication of this technology, we had to test different rigs, different materials, cables. It was called a three-headed monster. It didn't look like a monster to me, though. It was kind of nice. The software is called Flux. Uh, the F stands for facial, and Lux is uh, for the lighting component of it. With Flux, what we were trying to do is capture the facial performance of the actors. It's able to, to see how the face is shaded and how the lighting is hitting it and generate a lot of detail to incorporate this into our 3D model. We went through an entire library of scenes extracted from all of the past films across a spectrum of it. Okay, this is very important. The methodology behind this uh, uh, technology is to collect uh, the faces of the actors in the previous movies uh, uh, they were in. This is not the only methodology possible to, to um, de-age a face. There is a semiotic uh, a presumption be behind this uh, uh, issue. So I think one of the most interesting thing, things we can do is to develop uh, uh, semiotics of uh, uh, visual effects uh, because uh, we can do th the same thing in other way and the result is different. Uh, for example, if you use phase up, phase up uh, does not use your own images, uh, uh, your own images of your uh, um, uh, child, of your, of your childhood. Uh, phase up utilizes a, a database composed by images from uh, uh, taken from different subjects so the the methodology uh, it's slightly different but the result could be very different other example in gemini man which is a not very good movie but there is the courage to put in the same frame uh, the same actor in uh, two different ages so will smith uh, uh, acted the two roles, the, the, the roles of his uh, uh, adult version and the, roles, and the role of his uh, uh, young version. And uh, these versions are put together because it's a story about clonation and so on and so forth. And here again, we have the tracking of the movements with the um, spots. So as I said, a semiotics of facial uh, VF, VFX, uh, visual effects could be very interesting because there are implied uh, um, questions about the relationship between uh, uh, diegetic and extra diegetic level. Uh, as I write, the knowledge of or not of the actor's age of his past or his past uh, affects perception and inevitably pushes the, to confrontation. Uh, as uh, um, I go forward. A specific visual semiotics in this sense is transitory. It occurs only in the case in which the visual effects are poorly made and therefore are perceived as such. Live action and animated images are now, are now at such a level of integration that a visual semiotics focus on effects is a paradox when in the ontology of the image, they coexist with live context. A semiotics of the methodology for obtaining the aging is instead more profitable. The Irishman rejuvenates the actors by using data sets of repertoire images of the same at various ages to generate a lasting suspension of disbelief on the visual effect. At the same time, they preserve the actor's acting, building a new face in which muscularity, features, and acting come from different spaces and times and interpolate and are interpolated into a whole. But other types of the aging principle are possible, and each of these can have different effects. From an image ontology point of view, the relevant data is that the Robert De Niro of the film exists as body plus acting only in the film. Underlying this methodology is a specific idea of loyalty to oneself, which can, however, be supplanted by other assumptions. As I said, phase up. Here we have an example of applying phase up, uh, rejuvenating uh, the face of Italian comedian Macho Capatonda and, and doing this operation several times. I don't know if you uh, tried to do this, but if you rejuvenate yourself and, the, and then you rejuvenate the image already rejuvenated before, and you do this several times, the effects can be uh, quite interesting.
So there is the, the losing, the, 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 the progressive losing of the colors, the prog progressive losing of the contours of the uh, main element, the nose, the, the, the eyes, uh, uh, in order to be uh, younger and younger, uh, change their uh, forms. So this uh, change, of course, it's quite strange. I'm not sure it was provided or not, but we, we could try to do this uh, ex uh, experiment and see what happened because uh, it's a strange gender change, but also with, uh, with some uh, very visible glitches. Uh, and this is a, a very case of uncanny valley effect. I'm finishing, I promise. As I said, we walking, uh, sorry, working with the, these uh, overturnings with the manipulation of the rhetoric uh, of the association between behavior and faces and ages, we can generate lo lots of uh, interesting effects. An example is Baby Herman. Baby Herman is uh, one of the uh, main characters of this wonderful movie by Robert Zemeckis, uh, who framed Roger Rabbit, where uh, living uh, creatures, uh, live action creatures and living uh, uh, cartoons uh, uh, share the same uh, world. And here, for example, Baby Herman is a little uh, wonderful uh, uh, I don't know how to say newborn uh, ch uh, child uh, in the in the set, but then it turns out that uh, behind that uh, sweet face there is a grumpy man smoking a cigar, uh, saying bad words, and the effect is of course a comic effect here. Hey 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 wait a minute hey hey. I've been trying to make him quit, but he just won't listen to me. What do you know, you dumb broad? You got the IQ of a rattle. You valiant? Also, the relationship between face and voice, which is very typical in the uh, ch uh, possessed the children in movies, uh, uh, who have this uh, strong uh, uh, male voice. Other example, in Forrest Gump, we have the, the inverse relationship. We have a child in the body of an adult, while in Roger Rabbit, we had a bo a, a, an adult in the body of a child. Here, uh, uh, Forrest Gump uh, is a grown man, but uh, um, he has uh, a, a, a child uh, uh, behavior. Other example could be these two strange movies uh, paired by the fact that uh, there is this legend that uh, Big uh, uh, with Tom Hanks uh, uh, is a kind of an official remake of The Grande with uh, Renato Pozzetto because uh, the movie uh, the movies are exactly the same. The plot is the same and Big uh, um, was uh, in uh, Italian cinema before, uh, sorry, after The Grande. It's a, a, a urban legend. The story is more complicated than this, but. Uh, if you want to be patriotic, uh, let's say that uh, um, Tom Hanks uh, um, copied uh, Renato Pozzetto. The story is that uh, this uh, little uh, child uh, is in love with uh, um, her his teacher and uh, he wants to, to stay with her. So he, he desires uh, to, to grow um, in a very fast time, and it happens. So we see Renato Pozzetto, uh, an adult man, with the behavior of a child, as you can see in the trailer. Dovresti vergognarti! Oggi compi otto anni e ancora fai il pipì a letto. Posso venirci? Dove? Ad abitare con te. Ne riparliamo quando sarai grande, ok? Non avevi fatta tutto nel letto. Shh, cretina! Io sono tuo padre, sono grande, alto la voce quanto mi pare, hai capito? Tu sei bambino di otto anni, sei al tuo posto. Pisci a letto! <laughs> Voglio diventare grande! Voglio diventare grande! I figli crescono, diventano grandi! Buongiorno Francesca! Salve, ci conosciamo? Porca miseria! Sarà la solita scappatella da bambino. Ma non è mai stato via tanto tempo. Si vede che sta crescendo. No, il Lego non glielo posso dare, questi soldi non bastano. Ma come stamattina con più di 8 anni niente Lego è. Okay, if you like the movie, you can watch it. And if you're interested in more serious representation of this strange discrasia, an example could be the wonderful movie by Yorgos Lantimos, uh, 
uh, Doctus uh, Kinodontas, uh, uh, where these, uh, uh, these characters are adult characters, but they live uh, uh, imprisoned uh, by their father in, uh, in their home, and they couldn't develop their adultness in their behavior. So we see uh, adult bodies with uh, childish behavior, and the effect is quite disturbing in this case. Well, I, I finish here, and I thank you for your attention.